Okay. Uh, um. Uh, so, um, first of all, I have to announce this, this is weird. I heard that Terry, our TA, um, I heard before the weekend, like secondhand that she was in the hospital. I don't know what is going on with that. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't heard from her and like no one seems to know what's <laughs> uh so I guess I hope that's maybe that's confidential health information or something that I shouldn't be revealing. But but just so you know, if you're having trouble reaching her, I'm not sure uh uh what's up with her. Um and that's it. All right, I'll start talking about cock. Um, um, right, so where we are in the book. <laughs> the doctrine of elements is divided into the aesthetic and the logic. Um, the logic is divided into the transcendental analytic, which we've now finished. And the transcendental dialectic. We've now just started. And the reading for today was from the uh, introduction to the transcendental dialectic and the first part of the transcendental dialectic. So the transcendental dialectic has two parts concepts of pure reason and reason. Dialectical inferences of pure reason. And this part is much longer. Um, but we aren't going to read nearly all of it. Just hard times. Um, Okay, and we think we understand why the transcendental transcendental dialectic is here. Um, the transcendental analytic has shown um, what makes synthetic judgments of the understanding intellectual synthetic a priori judgments possible. Right, remember that we showed that certain kinds of synthetic a priori judgments are possible in the transcendental aesthetic because they're based on the form of sensibility. That is the mathematical judgments, right? But the, met the metaphysical ones, we've shown uh, how they're possible and actually even shown what they are, basically. <laughs> um, and uh, in, in doing so, it's also shown what the limits of metaphysical knowledge are. Um, because the, the way we showed um, that such judgments were possible was by showing that it must be possible to synthesize the manifold in experience. Um, what is manifold what is manifold in sense in space and time as the image of empirical concepts so uh, that's the only source of validity for those synthetic a priori judgments uh, and and so obviously they don't uh, apply to things that are not objects of sense that are not in space and time right they 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 get their possibility they get their their objective validity from the fact that uh, they must be true because we must be we must have an empirical object. so that means we like um and in in the section called phenomena 
and Numina um, taught, at least as I understand it, tried to explain exactly how it is that you can understand that as knowing a limit between things we can know and things we can't know. Um, so, so basically, I mean, we've already got here the division of metaphysics into the good kind and the bad kind that I mentioned at the right when I talked about the preface at the beginning of the course. Right, the, the, the good kind is imminent metaphysics, where imminent here just means that it remains within the bounds of experience. Um, and the bad kind is transcendent metaphysics. That is metaphysics that tries to talk about things that are not possible objects of experience. Um, And so, right, notice, as I mentioned several times, transcendent doesn't mean the same thing as transcendental, although they turn out to be related to each other. But, um, but transcendent, a transcendental employment of the categories is a use of the categories to refer to any object whatsoever, whether or not it's an object of sense. But a transcendent employment of the categories would be an attempt to use the categories to refer to something that couldn't possibly be object of sense. Um, and um, so, I mean, that is, we've already established that this kind is good, and this, that is by good, I mean, this kind is possible for us. In fact, Kant says he's laid out the whole foundation of it. And it's just the details need to be filled in. And on the other hand, it's also by the same token shown, shown that this part is impossible for us. Um, so what is the transcendental di dialectic going to do? Well, we think, you know, based on the word dialectic, right? Remember, Kant uh, explains at the introduction in the introduction to the transcendental logic as a whole. He explained that dialectic um, is uh, means like the art of logical illusion. <laughs> um, so like sophistry, basically, right? Like making things look like they're lot they're good logical arguments when they're really not. Um, but he said, um, obviously, uh, I'm not going to be telling you how to do that. I'm going to be telling you how to guard against that or how it works in order to guard against it. But, but moreover, he said, uh, in the case of general logic, that's kind of optional because, because these uh, formal logical uh, sophisms or like uh, illusory inferences uh, only take your limb as long as you're distracted and don't notice how they work. But as soon as, as soon as you realize what the trick is, the illusion goes away. So it's not really a, an illusion in the sense of like an optical illusion, whereas at the beginning of the transcendental dialectic, he says, well, actually, where to? He says, but in the case of transcendental logic, um, as he puts it, these are sophisms not of human beings, but of reason itself, <laughs> right? So, so actually dialectic here is not an art that someone has to study because it's natural to us to be deluded in this way. Um, I guess, uh, one thing to notice about this word dialectic um, so like it looks like this has like a two in it <laughs> um, but it really doesn't 
becomes straight away the Greek verb dialegain, which means and this part dia means through. And this part means to speak or argue. Right. So dialoguing means to like talk through, something like that. Argue through. Um, uh, this Greek preposition and verb prefix dia is related to the word for two, but it's not, it like doesn't mean that still in Greek. It means through. Um, so, uh, so like when we contrast uh, monologue, dialogue versus monologue, that's actually like a mistake. <laughs> it doesn't, the word dialogue doesn't actually have two in it. Um, and, um, and I don't think Kant thinks of the term dialectic as intrinsically having something about back and forth to it. I mean, we'll see that in the dialectical inferences, there's one part called the antinomy. And within the antinomy, there's always a thesis and antithesis, right? But that's specific to the antinomy. The other parts don't have that. Yeah. But a, a silly question, but like in, with the, the Greek word, the through, is that like meant in the sense of like, like let's talk through this or like, a, I don't know, how is the through supposed to be interpreted there? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but it doesn't mean to. I mean, the, in other words, so dialoguing does, does, I guess, among other things, mean to have a conversation, but, but it, why this, why the through, I, I think it's similar to the reason we say talk through something, but I don't, you know, don't know exactly. I'm actually not a native Greek or speaker of ancient Greek, so I can't tell you the exact connotations, but right. So, but neither was Kant, right? I mean, people always say that Kant didn't know Greek. I, I think he probably knew Greek, you know, better than, probably knew Greek better than I do. He just didn't like know Greek, like the way you should know Greek. Or, yeah, because I mean, obviously he knows enough Greek to use a ton of Greek terminology. Uh, but anyway, Right, so and that's why I think I said when someone when it was you asked last like how it's related to Hegel's use of the word dialect. Yeah. Like, yeah, so I mean, Hegel does seem to think that dialectic, you know, inherently has this back and forth nature to it, and I think that's a misunderstanding of the word, and also, you know, potentially at least a misunderstanding of. Oh. I mean, I'm not. Of course, it's risky to say that because it's just as likely that I don't understand Hegel. But yeah, I don't want to get digress too much. But what about in terms of like, uh, like Plato's idea of dialectic or like the like a Socratic dialogue or something like that with like two interlocutors like going back and forth. Yeah, I mean, although often it's more than two, you know, uh, but and sometimes like in the apology, it's mostly just one, but um, like I said, this, I mean, a dialogue is a conversation, I think it's, you know, so like it's, it, it's not that it doesn't mean that, but I just, I don't think the, uh, I don't think the word by itself means that, and I don't, and it's, and, a, and then when, when Plato himself talks about dialectic, I, is that I don't, no, I mean, it depends how you interpret Plato, I guess, but, <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I don't see any sign that, that Kant interprets that as, I mean, Kant says what he thinks dialectic means. Um, 
So anyway, that's that's just about the word. Uh, I, I don't actually know the history of the term dialogue for those works about Socrates, like Socratic dialogues that Plato and Xenophon and other people wrote. We don't have the other ones, I guess, but there are other people also wrote Socratic dialogues besides Plato and Xenophon. I don't know how early we know that they were called dialogues. Anyway. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, so anyway, so basically what we expect this part to do is to, you know, this part has shown that we shouldn't pass these bounds, but then, like, uh, it turns out to be hard not to pass those bounds, <laughs> and this part is supposed to explain why it's hard, essentially what the illusion is, why we can't completely make it go away. Um, but also, we're not gonna read like all of, of this part, but also like, you might ask, why is our nature so defective <laughs> that we're led astray in this, in this really important matter? And the, you know, basically the answer is, well, the, the, the very things that tend to lead us astray are really important if you use them properly, if you understand them properly. Um, so all of that is what the transcendental dialectic is about. However, so that's what we expect it to be about, and that is what it's about. But when as, at the very beginning, there's all kinds of surprises. So like, I think the most surprising thing, I mean, of course, it's not surprising if you read the title of the book, um, and it's not surprising, maybe if you read, like if you remember what the division of the transcendental logic was supposed to be, but it's still kind of surprising. There's this faculty reason, which we've heard very little about so far. Um, and um, so now suddenly we find out that the transcendental dialectic is not going to be about errors of the understanding, but about errors of reason. Now, I mean, it's not as bad as I make it out to be, but I'm going to say why in a second, right? But still, I mean, like, it's there's like a new character here. And um, uh, it turns out that reason has its own concept. Right, that's why the first part is called the concepts of pure reason. So pure reason has its own concepts, not the same as the categories. Um, so, right, like if we expected the lesson here was don't try to use the categories beyond the realm of experience. And we expect here to say, what is the illusion that leads us to nevertheless try to use the categories beyond the realm of experience? But all of a sudden, instead of the categories, we're talking about these other concepts, the concepts of reason. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so um, well, maybe I should do that actually because I was going to read what comes right before oh. it. So uh, this is B three fifty two on page two ninety nine. Um. Um, in the case of these latter, that is in the case of the transcendent, um, of transcendent principles, that's what he's just talking about. 
In the case of these latter, I am not referring to the transcendental employment or misemployment of the categories, which is merely an error of the faculty of judgment when it is not duly curbed by criticism, and therefore does not pay sufficient attention to the bounds of the territory within which alone free play is allowed to pure understanding. Um, so, He's saying, I think this is more evidence for, for what I think is going on in phenomena and noumena. That he's saying that the illusion he's talking, or the, the principles he's talking about here are not the principles that are responsible for us trying to make a transcendental use of the categories. That's what we were talking about phenomena and noumena and in the amphiboly. I mean, that's what he explicitly talks about there, right? that we think the categories have a trans transcendental employment because they have a transcendental meaning. But, but it turns out they don't. But what he said in that quote I just read is that's a mere error of the faculty of judgment when it's not duly curbed. And meaning, I, like, whose judgment makes this error? Well, Leibniz, right? Leibniz's judgment makes this error because it's not duly curbed by criticism. But as I as I said before, I think the idea is, but this is like uh, this is not like an optical illusion. When it is duly curbed by criticism, uh, we'll, we won't make that error of judgment anymore. An error of judgment is the error of like um, identifying the case to which your concept applies. Right? Remember, that's what judgment is about: the application of rules to cases. The error of judgment is an error of mis mis uh, identifying the case to which your your concept applies, and um, right like not noticing that the case it applies to is the case of our form of sensibility rather than objects in general. Um, but he says here I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about a completely different kind of principle. And as I said, it's going to come with a completely different kind of concept. So just the, the principles are going to be transcendent principles. Right? This, this, this goes on. I mean actual principles which incite us to tear down all those boundary fences and to seize possession of an entirely do, new domain, uh, which recognizes no limits of demarcation. So it's... So a transcendent principle, again, is not just one that fails to limit the categories to the proper case. It's a principle that um, this, this case is, right? This is like the realm of experience. So transcendental employment of the categories is an error of judgment where you just don't notice that this is the case you should be talking about. But a transcendent principle is one that incites you specifically to leave this realm of experience and deal with something which couldn't possibly be part of the realm of experience. And these concepts of pure reason are going to be transcendent concepts. That is, they're going to be concepts whose object could never be met with an experience. Which again is really different from the categories, right? The whole the categories, it turns out in the end that the whole point of the categories is to have objects within the realm of experience. Right? That every time we form an empirical concept, we do it by using the categories. And so, like, um, the way we have any empirical objects of concepts is by them being objects of the categories. Right? So, the, the whole point of the categories is their image. Or, or empirical use, as he also calls it. But these concepts of pure reason couldn't have a use like that because they're, they, they, uh, the rule they prescribe to their object is one that no object of experience could possibly conform to. I mean, just like to say what they are, The, the first one is the concept of the noumenal self or rational soul, intelligible soul, right? The soul that's not known through inner sense, um, that's not empirical. The second one is the concept of the world 
as a totality. Right? The whole world as taken as an object the way this piece of cinnabar is an object. Where we we like have got all the parts of it and then we add them all up to one whole. And the last one is, well, I mean, it turns out that in the first place, it's it's really the idea of the sum of all possibilities. Um, but by a, a kind of further natural step, we make that into the concept of a certain being, God. All right. So, so these are the three ideas of reason. And they're all supposed to be things. I mean, this one, obviously, it's not an empirical thing. That's the idea of it. Um, this one also, like whether it's God or whether it's the sum of all possibilities, um, uh, it's the sum of all possible possibilities for things in general, not just for phenomena. So it's not something that could possibly even experience. And, you know, this is the weirdest one because, so to speak, all the parts of it could be given an experience, but the whole couldn't be given an experience. Okay, but um, so, so again, it's a little weird that all of a sudden this new faculty and its new concepts uh, are introduced. But as I was starting to say, um, it's not as bad as it sounds. So like right before the passage I was reading, um, so this is still on B352, but it's on page 298 in Kemp Smith. In defiance of all the warnings of criticism, it, I guess it here refers to the transcendental illusion. In defiance of all the warnings of criticism, it carries us all together beyond the employment of categories and puts us off with a merely, oh, sorry, carries us all together beyond the empirical employment of categories and puts us off with a merely deceptive extension of pure understanding. So, right, although this is about reason and its concepts, it's somehow like, what reason is doing with its concepts somehow results in a misemployment of the understanding. And the error that we end up with is gonna be an error of the understanding. And in fact, um, on the previous page, um, so this is B350 and page 297 in Kemp Smith. Truth and error, therefore, and consequently also illusion as leading to error, are only to be found in the judgment, that is, uh, only in the relation of the object to our understanding. Right, the understanding is the faculty of intellectually representing objects. So to make a mistake about an object, um, I mean, so it's the faculty that can accurately represent an object. Um, and I guess, I mean, I said it's the faculty of intellectually representing an object, but it's really like, remember, you know, Um, just to be affected in many ways is not like doesn't itself allow me to refer to an object outside of me. The object, if there is one, is the the thing that contains the principle according to which this manifold happens. Um, right. So, if, so to represent an object through sensations, I have to be able to represent this rule that the object is using to affect me. 
Right? Without it, all I know is that I'm I'm affected. I'm not I, I'm not representing an object. So that's why Kant, you know, first of all says way back when he first talked about this, he said, intuitions without concepts are blind. Concepts without intuitions are empty. Right? That is the intuition without a concept doesn't look out of itself. It's, it doesn't form a perspective on something. Concepts without intuitions are empty. We understand that, right? The concept is a rule for unifying a manifold and intuition. If there's no manifold and intuition, the concept's not unifying anything, and it, so it doesn't represent an object. But the point, I, the point I'm trying to make here is that the actual represent, representation of the object as such is the work of the understanding although it needs sensibility to do it, right? So the accurate representation of the object is a case where the, the rule, this rule matches this rule, but the, the error is a case where this rule doesn't match this rule. So error in general is a function of the understanding. Like reason can only make a mistake by, um, causing the understanding to make a mistake. Um, and in fact, the, so the overall uh, organization of the dialectic is gonna be like this. I guess, I don't know, it's just... Okay. Right, so we have the soul, the world, and God, the three concepts of reason. Um, the three uh, transcendental ideas. And, um, and each of those is each of these is going to correspond to a kind of dialectical inference of reason, right? So again, this is where in in this column, the dialectical inferences are going to be opposed to each other. Reason is going to reach contradictory conclusions on on the same thing. But that's only here on this side, and then this side is not going to happen. So dialectical inference again just means like a bad, a bad but apparently good inference, right? So, um, so there's going to be three types of dialectical inference of reason, but then at, at least this is very clear in the first two. Each of those is going to break down into four sub inferences, and these follow the category. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll see in the paralogisms, the order is switched around, actually. It's, and Kant says that, right? He says, we're going to start with substance instead of starting with quantity. Um, but, uh, um, whereas in this one, they go in the usual order. In this one, there is no clear structure like that. So, it's difficult to know which order they go in. <laughs> um, but uh, um, but so just like this is explicit. So on page B B four oh two on three thirty in Kemp Smith. Um This is from the uh, beginning of the paralogisms. So, sorry, I should say, right? This, these three parts are called, this is called the paralogisms of pure reason. This is called the antinomy of pure reason. And this is called the ideal of pure reason. 
he also says that this is about rational psychology, this is about rational cosmology, and this is about transcendental theology. All right, so from the beginning of the paralogisms, all that is here required is that we follow the guidance of the categories with this difference only, that since our starting point is a given thing, I as thinking being, we begin with the category of substance, whereby a thing, so I think this is really should be translated, whereby a thing as such is represented. Kemp Smith translated as whereby a thing in itself is represented, which is confusing because things in themselves are not represented by the categories. But, you know, but remember that the phrase that's being translated as in itself is ansich, and this just, it just means per se. Um, so, like, I tried to explain why uh, the objects of uh, intellectual intuition could be called things per se. Um, they, roughly speaking, I said it's because they're things just in so far as they're objects of the faculty that they're objects of, right? That it, it that is it represents them by means of their essence that makes them what it, what they are. Um, but you know, but there's lots of other uses of per se besides just that one thing, right? And I think all that Kant is saying here is that substance is the category that represents things. That is that represents its object as a thing. Um, right? Because quality is what is the remember the first moment of quality is reality, that is things. And what has reality is the thing. So the substance is the subject of qualities and quantities. Um, anyway. That, that's just his explanation of why he's going in a different order here. The main point I want is that Ray, he says, and then, you know, you can see there's one of those diamond shaped tables here, with the four paralogisms. In the A edition, where the paralogism is much longer, there are actually four different syllogisms and each one is discussed. In the B edition, Besides the change in the transcendental deduction, the biggest change is the paralogisms, where he um, made them much shorter. Partly, I think he just summarized things that he said at greater length in the A edition. Partly, he moved some of the things he discussed in the paralogisms earlier. Um, like in the A edition, the closest thing that corresponds to the refutation of idealism happens in the paralogisms. Whereas in the B edition, that was moved to the uh, postulates to into the transcendental analytic. All right. So anyway, that's from the beginning of the paralogisms. Um, and there's something similar at the beginning of the antinomies. So this is... Um, B... 438 on page 493. In arranging the table of ideas in accordance with the table of categories, we first take the two original quanta of all our intuition, space and time, and then he goes through all the categories. That is, he goes through all the headings of the categories and explains uh, how he's going to get an antinomy out of each one of them. And in the in the third part, in the ideal, he does say, so this is B608 on page 493. If following up this idea of ours, we proceed to hypostatize it, right? So this is what I was talking about, how like really it's it's kind of like a further mistake to take this to be the idea of a thing um, to, that is to hypostasize it, to make it into a substance. Um, but anyway, so he says, if in following up this idea of ours, we proceed to hypostatize it, we shall be able to determine the primordial being 
through the mere concept of the highest reality as a being that is one, simple, all-sufficient, eternal, etc. In short, we shall be able to determine it in its unconditioned completeness through all predicaments. Predicament is, means the same thing as category, right? Predicament is the Latin equivalent of category. So I think he's saying there again that when we like work out what God is according to this illusory science of transcendental theology, we're going to do it by going through each of the categories. The problem is there's more than four things on that list. And some of them uh some of them seem to have already been used in the other lists, and some of them don't seem to be categories at all, like eternal, all sufficient. What does that mean? I guess that's supposed to be the category of relation. Yeah, maybe once. One simple, all sufficient, and then eternal is supposed to correspond to modality. But then he says, et cetera. <laughs> so I don't know. And like in neither edition is does does this part actually break down into four parts? Um okay, so um but but the moral of all this is that. Although this illusion is somehow particularly an illusion of reason, it's going to, reason is going to, we fall into it by allowing reason to incite us to use the categories the wrong way. And so the actual errors we make are going to be broken down according to the categories, just like practically everything else in Kant. <laughs> um, Now, um, it seems like there must be some connection between this and like the general things he says about illusion at the beginning of the transcendental dialectic. Um, I mean, because he says like the understanding left to its own would never go astray if it always followed its own principles. Because he says no natural uh, power ever goes against its own laws. And how how do we know that, or what kind of principle is that? Is maybe not clear, but anyway, that's so. Uh, that's what he says. Um, so you might think, uh, yeah. Here's what we see is reason un interfering with the understanding and leading it astray. Um, the problem with that in terms of interpretation is so this is B350 or so page 2 yeah, from page 298. Right? No natural force can of itself deviate from its own laws. Thus, neither the understanding by itself uninfluenced by another cause, nor the senses by themselves would fall into error. The former would not, since if it acts only according to its own laws, the effect, that is, the judgment, must necessarily be in conformity with these laws. Conformities with the laws of the understanding is the formal element in all truth. In the senses, there is no judgment whatsoever, neither a true nor a false judgment. Right? That's basically that same picture I was just drawing, right? The senses by themselves don't actually represent any, anything about an object if you leave them by themselves. There is no judgment in them. Um, the, on the other hand, he says the understanding, if, if the senses weren't there and the understanding was just like somehow doing its own thing, now it wouldn't be representing an object, 
but it wouldn't fall into error. What kind of the only kind of error I could make in that case would be a logical error, right? And he's and he's saying the understanding by itself wouldn't fall into logical error. Now, since we have no source of knowledge besides these two, it follows that error is brought about solely by the unobserved influence of sensibility on the understanding. Through which it happens that the subjective grounds of the judgment, and Kemp Smith translates enter into union with, but I think should, it should be translated as are confused with the objective grounds and make these latter deviate from their true function. Just as a body in motion would always of itself continue in a straight line in the same direction, but if influenced by another force acting in another direction, starts off into cur curvilinear motion, right? Influenced by another force, because the way Kant and most people think about momentum at this time is that momentum is, is kind of a force. But the body has its own force, which is its momentum. And another force changes it. And that's what would make the body deviate from a straight line. Um, I mean, we don't think of the momentum of the body as a force. Although it's, it's, it's changed by a force. Um, anyway, be that as it may, the point here is that um, like the body by itself would keep moving this way. And you apply a force to it in this direction. So instead it's gonna move this way. And if you keep doing that, it will curve around. So, um, so he's saying that Similarly, the understanding by itself would um, uh, would always, I guess, just make. I mean, it's hard to understand what it mean what it would mean for the understanding to act just by itself. <laughs> but the understanding by itself would, it, maybe it's just like an abstraction. It can't really act by itself. But the point is, like. The, the understanding of its own accord it just makes logically correct judgments. Um, the senses by themselves accurately reflect how I'm affected. They are how I'm affected. So they can't, it can't go wrong. It's not a judgment about something else. But it's somehow when you put them together, the senses um, leave the understanding astray, and there, it's in this specific way that the subjective grounds of the judgment become confused with the objective grounds. Um, so he says, for example, that the sea at the horizon looks higher than at the shore. Now, is that true? <laughs> but he, he, he gives another, a, a better example, and he himself says it's a stronger example, is the way the moon looks big when it's near the horizon, right? Even though it's not actually, uh, right? Like it doesn't occupy a greater angle when it's at the horizon than when it's at the meridian, but it, it looks like it does. <laughs> But the problem is that it doesn't really have a good explanation for that illusion. And as far as I know, the, the explanation of that illusion is still controversial. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Also, there's alleged this illusion that the sea at the horizon, at the horizon looks higher. So, you know, like here's the sea, and he says, um, it looks higher because we see it by means of higher rays. So something really is high, <laughs> but what's higher is the way I am affected, not the object. That's the confusion of subjective and objective grounds, right? Like, 
um, I, I mistake the thing. Um, um, yes, India didn't promise that. You should, you should think as you do when you're doing computer graphics, kind of think of my field of vision as like a, a plane here. <laughs> Right, like I'm looking down at the right. It's like if you wanted to draw the sea on the screen, that's what you would do. Imagine the screen kind of floating in front of you and intercepting the rays that come from the ocean. And these lower rays hit actually hit it lower down than these higher rays. And I mean, this is a subjective ground of the judgment because you know it, it's only by means of this like spread in my field of vision that I'm able to represent the extent of the ocean at all, right? And like if they all came in at the same point, I wouldn't be able to represent the ocean at the horizon as higher or lower or anything. <laughs> um, so these really are grounds of the judgment, but they're subjective grounds of the judgment that is like, this is the means by which I'm able to um, schematize my concept of the ocean or some some concept i don't know what the concept is maybe it's a geometrical concept of a plane or something anyway right so i'm schematizing my concept using this order of affections of me <laughs> um and if i do it correctly i'll you know um i'll understand I'll represent these as resulting from a certain ground in the object, right? From a certain principle in the object, like how it reflects light. Um, so those are the objective grounds, right? So if I do it right, I'll using this subjective order, I'll, I'll represent the ocean as going that way, basically. But if I do it wrong, I confuse these subjective grounds with the objective grounds. And then I start to think that I should, I start to represent the ocean as having this order, that the order of my field of vision rather than its order. Right, so that's, you know, I mean, whether that probably can't explain all optical illusions. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think a lot of optical illusions have been discovered since Kant's time and they're really weird, you know, these things where, where you look at a, a pattern of dots and they seem to like start jumping around and stuff like that, but yeah. That one where it's like a, a spinning ballerina where if you look at it in one way, it looks like she's spinning this way. And then all of a sudden it looks like she's spinning the other way. You can never really get the, the image of the ballerina like without Feeling that it's spinning this way or this way, but you can never have a. Yeah. Never. I mean, you know, in, in a way, that's not as good a case as this, though, because there isn't a real ballerina. So I guess, yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that we now call optical illusion, I noticed that Kant doesn't use examples like that. And I don't know if that's because he didn't know that there are examples like that, or, but. You know, a lot of the things we now call optical illusions are, um, well, you know, I'd say it's not called that. Like, if this was a real cube, you couldn't see it kind of like one way and the other way. <laughs> um, it's so, the, I mean, I guess. The fundamental illusion, and and it does, and that does fit Kant's uh, scheme here. The fundamental illusion is there's a cube, <laughs> right? Like you shouldn't see a cube at all when you look at this. There is no cube. It's a flat figure, right? And it has like it has a little square here, and it has a triangle here, and etc. Right? <laughs> but instead, you see a cube. You know, and I think it's the same thing with the spinning ballerina. There's no, there's no, nothing is spinning. Some lines are moving back and forth. <laughs> the, the fundamental illusion is that you take those lines moving back and forth 
Um, well, uh, maybe it's been, a, I shouldn't get lost in this. Is, is that the opposite of this or is that the same as this? Somehow confusing objective and subjective terms. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the reason I shouldn't get lost in this is because, of course, the transcendental dialectic is not about optical illusions, right? But so the question is, how does this theory apply to the transcendental illusion? And, you know, so one thing I'm still really not, under, not sure about is, so he says right there that illusion always results from the interference of the senses with the understanding, because those are the only two sources of knowledge. So that, on the other hand, like the natural way to see what's going on here is that the illusion results in the interference of reason with the understanding. And I don't know whether, I'm not sure whether to, to think, oh, of course, there, when he talked about the senses and the understanding, it's to be understood. We're talking about sense illusions, <laughs> right? It doesn't apply to this. But then the thing about those being our only two sources of knowledge still, like, it's weird, right? Because we don't get another source of knowledge here. I don't think. Those really are our two sources of knowledge. Um, so that suggests, no, maybe we should try to understand how the sense is responsible for this too, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so... Um, but uh, but what I do understand is that um, there is some kind of confusion of subjectivity and objectivity in the transcendental illusion. Um, right, this is right around the same area, B five three fifty three on page two ninety nine. After explaining that there's a transcendental illusion that does not cease, even after it has been detected, etc., then he says, the cause of this is that there are fundamental rules and maxims for the employment of our reason, subjectively regarded as a faculty of human knowledge, and that these have all the appearance of being objective principles. Right? So again, there's a there's some kind of confusion of subjectivity and objectivity. The true use of the principles of reason is um, as like advice to the understanding on what to do, what to look for. And we'll see more details of that, what, how that's supposed to work. But that's the true use of them. So I mean, it's not exactly parallel to this thing with my field of vision, but it's, it's subjective. <laughs> like, it, it's supposed to tell us what to do. But the illusion is that these principles demand something from the object, that they're supposed to tell the object what to do. The way the categories do tell the object what to do. Ray Kant says the understanding gives the law to nature, <laughs> right? The, 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 the categories, we, it is legitimate to demand that the manifold and sense conform to the categories. That's what the transcendental de deduction showed. But, there, but the illusion is that there's something parallel to that in the case of reasoning, whereas actually there isn't. The, the, the legitimate use of the, of the principles of reason is subjective. Um, well, I hope I'm not going to run out of power. All right. Which one do I have? Should probably make it. Those of you who are who are watching on Zoom, if I suddenly disappear, well, probably because my laptop ran out of power. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, but one way or the other, there's one other thing I want to say about this about this point about the addition of factors, basically, as we would call it, that. Um, 
So this is a case of opposition of forces, right? Of like two positive powers, sense and understanding that together add up to something uh, that, that together in some way uh, destroy each other, cancel each other. Right, remember, each one by itself would keep doing the right thing, but then somehow when you add them together, you get the wrong thing. So we heard in the amphiboly that we can only understand that in space. Right, that, that, that we, we can make no sense of the concepts of reflection, agreement, and opposition, except because space contains a uh, opposition of directions. And this, so this literal addition of forces thing is, right, has to do with the fact that the forces can point in different directions in space. If they point in exactly the opposite direction, they just cancel each other. Oh. Um. Um. Somehow I've gone to But never mind. <laughs> anyway. This makes it look like the closer they got it together, the last more you would have come. That's fine. All right. Anyway, um, um so, oh, I, no, I mean, I guess that is, no, that's true, right. So if they point in exactly the same direction, you would add them together end to end, right? So like this one was one, and this one was one, and they pointed in the same direction, you would get two. If they pointed in the opposite direction, you would get zero. If it's something in between, you get something in between zero. And the sense in which I'm saying they cancel each other out, is that to the extent that this sum is less than two, they partly their 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 force hasn't all made it into the sum. Right. Okay. So uh, but again, so here we understand that we can understand that because we're literally talking about directions in space. If you take the amphiboly seriously, um then um, you have to say that when the senses and the understanding uh, interfere with each other, literally forces are pointing in the opposite direction. So. Because otherwise we couldn't understand this. Um, So, in other words, the the beings who are subject to the to sense illusions, but also to the transcendental illusion, are are essentially embodied. Um, and that makes sense, after all. Remember, from the reputation of idealism, the only kind of substance we can represent for theoretical purposes, is a body, an extended substance. Um, so in other words, this is, this is a way of seeing that, right, th this, this part of the transcendental dialectic is about the illusory science of rational psychology. The, the way we can know about the self not as an object of experience, supposedly. And right, and the conclusion is going to be it's an illusion. We can't. Um, and you, the transcendental dialectic itself is not rational psychology. So it's about the kind of being that exists in space and time. <laughs> um, and, you know, that. Um, Remember, I was 
I was pointing out what a weird place the amphibole is. In. Like that, how it's, it seems to introduce these fundamental new concepts as the appendix to a like kind of unexpected section that you're not sure what it's for. And then there's this long, long appendix. Um, that's, and, then, and the appendix has lots of stuff about Leibniz that maybe you don't care about and whatever. Like, why is it there? Why isn't the table of concepts of reflection right after the categories? <laughs> like, why doesn't why doesn't the schematism con contain the discussion of how they related to space? So, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, and the, so, the thing I've got to say is a little bit. Um, risky or uh, speculative <laughs> in, a, in a bad sense of speculative that but um, but it's possible that Kant is worried about his readers noticing how materialistic the theoretical philosophy actually is. He doesn't want the wrong kind of reader to to notice that because you know uh, so in the practical philosophy Kant is going to treat the self as noumenal. If we're, this were, I mean, uh, it's because basically the will is it, the will as such is its own object. That's it's an end in itself, as Kant says, uh, which again is an sich, right? So the will is actually is its own object per se, and therefore the will as object of the will is a noumena. <laughs> um, but. Um, um, so, um, so Kant thinks that this theoretical materialism isn't going to have the bad um, ethical and religious consequences that you might expect materialism to have, precisely because he's limited the theoretical philosophy within bounds. As he said in the preface, I had to destroy knowledge to make room for faith, right? But um, but you might worry, Kant might worry that someone would think the theoretical part was really great and not understand or not care about the practical part. And that then they would end up with all those bad conclusions after all. <laughs> um, like I said, it's, I mean, um, it's speculative <laughs> as far as cosmos for doing. But you, I mean, it is true that you see. Uh, well, is it true? It's true that if you look for it, that's what they call confirmation bias, <laughs> something like that. But like, it's true that if you look for it, you can find lots of philosophers apparently burying important and possibly dangerous things in the middle of boring stuff with a misleading title <laughs> right i pointed out that uh, that out in 100c about Locke's ethics in the essay how they're like buried in the middle of a chapter called on other relations <laughs> um all right uh And this is this this is a Straussian principle of interpretation. Straussianism is a weird school and kind of uh, disreputable in certain ways, but <laughs> this principle seems like there might be something to it. All right. Anyway, um, let me go back to what Kant is actually talking about. <laughs> so okay, so what is reason? That's after discussing all of this. <laughs> The relate how you know why we get reason here rather than the understanding. Well, it really is the understanding. Reason is interfering with it somehow, etc. Okay, what is reason? Um. So, um. So unfortunately, this is what Kant says about it. This is B three fifty five on page three hundred. Now that I have to give an explanation of this highest faculty of knowledge, 
I find myself in some difficulty. <laughs> <It's> like, oops. <laughs> If you're in some difficulty, we're really in difficulty. But what is the difficulty? So the difficulty basically is that reason, like the understanding, has two uses. Um, logical and real, or he also says transcendental. Now, Transcendental use was a name for something to not do with the categories, <laughs> but I think this is a different sense of transcendental use. Um, I mean, so again, transcendental, like transcendental predicates are predicates of objects in general. So one way of understanding transcendental use of the understanding is trying to use the understanding to represent objects in general rather than just the objects of sense. So that's a bad sense of transcendental use of the understanding. But another way of understanding of transcendental use of the understanding is like the um, on the model of the difference between formal logic and transcendental logic. That the logical use of the understanding is the use of the understanding that somehow just has to do with the form of our representations, whereas the transcendental use of the understanding is the use of the understanding to represent the objects. So in that sense, transcendental use of the understanding is fine, <laughs> right? So um, so similarly, and that's also why it's called the like the real use, the use to uh, to represent the thing. So similarly, reason. Um, has a merely formal or logical use and a real use. Now, I mean, um, the real use, if we take it to be that reason has concepts, that the, the pure concepts of reason represent objects, if we think that's the real or transcendental use of reason, then that's going to be the transcendental illusion, right? So in a sense, reason doesn't have this use. But it does as long as, again, is, as long as we think of this as advising the understanding on how to represent its object. not telling it to represent some object. So so like the bad use is basically reason says, I must be able to represent this object that's not object of experience, right? That's taking it that the, 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 uh, the concept of pure reason directly represent objects. And then it says, oh, how, how am I gonna describe this? Well, I need the, the transcendental predicates that is the categories. And then it ropes the understanding into representing this transcendent object. But the good use is that the understanding represents its, its legitimate object, that is the object of experience, and reason is going to tell it how to do that. So like, to, to not leave it so abstract, the, so, I mean, uh, as I've mentioned several times, one aspect of the transcendental illusion is to think that the world either must have a beginning in time or it must always have existed. That's one of the antinomies, right? So those are representations of the world as a whole with respect to its quantity, right? So that's a case where the understand, where the reason has said, okay, I have a representation of the world as a whole that must have an object. And now, and now I'm gonna to try to get the understanding to represent it using its categories, for example, quantity. And then the understanding comes in and says, well, okay, well, to represent it as a quantity, we're gonna to have to measure it, you know, and then like, um, and then reach a, a finished totality. And for reasons we'll talk about later, it only really only demands that it be finished on the beginning side, not on the end side. And then it says, oh, how can a totality be completely finished? 
well, either this is the first unit you could ever have and there's nothing before it, or we have all the units all the way back, <laughs> infinitely many, right? So like that's that's the antinomy. So that's the bad use, the bad real use of reason. But the good real use of reason is something like this. The understanding represents something as happening at a certain time. Um, and by itself, it doesn't really care whether uh, it can find another something else at the previous time. But reason says, don't stop here. Always look to see what happened before. <laughs> That's the advice. Right, and you can see how that doesn't result in ever telling the understanding to represent the past of the world as a whole. It just always tells it, it just tells it not to stop. That so that's kind of a model of how the the real or how the, the regulative real use of reason is supposed to work, and how it's different from the the bad one. <laughs> The 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 uh, alleged constitutive real use of reason, um, but anyway, so the difficulty is what's you know Kant says I'm in some difficulty. What's the difficulty? The difficulty is um, to explain what the faculty of reason is in a way that's sufficiently abstract that it includes both this and this, um, and. Uh, why does he need to do that? Well, so he did that in the case of the understanding. He said the understanding is a faculty of rules. Um, and um, the logical use of the understanding has to do with like presenting the object of one, of one rule as the object for, for another rule to make judgments possible. Right, so like making a judgment about cinnabar possible by making the, the rule cinnabar available in three different ways. Well, actually in all the different ways of the whole table of judgments, but staying with quantity for a moment in three different ways to become the object of another rule. So this all goes on without worrying about what the object is. Right? Like so for example, the you know uh, the understanding presents this rule as a possible subject of a universal judgment where this is the predicate. Like this is the predicate. And this is the subject. But then the real use of the understanding is to use a rule to represent the manifold in sense as united in a certain way. And the metaphysical deduction said the same function that does this also does that. <laughs> right? So we learned from the possible types of judgment what the categories were. So now he wants to do the same thing here. He wants to take the logical function of reason and show how we get the concepts of pure reason from the logical, from, from considering that the same function that works in the logical employment also has another side that points to the object, so to speak. Um, okay, so the logical use of, so the logical use of the understanding is what make, it consists in making judgments possible, making judgments, depending on how you look at it. The logical use of reason consists in making syllogisms possible.
So a syllogism is a type of inference, right? That it's it's a type of conclusion of one judgment from one or more other judgments. I guess Kant really thinks of it as a conclusion of one judgment from another judgment. That is, the syllogism takes one judgment. Let's say that. That's not really how Kant thinks about it. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, okay. How does Kant think about it? Rather than getting it more confused, let me. So, Here's okay, so here's one way to think about an inference. An inference means um, um, I tell you that if you've written down things of the following three forms, you're now allowed to write down something else. <laughs> right? So, like uh, to keep it simple rather than three, just have it be two, right? So, like if you've written down P implies Q, and you've written down P, you're now allowed to write down Q, right? This is called modus ponens. So um, that's, uh, that's a way of thinking about what an inference is. I give you, and in general, I could take a whole long list of things and say, if you have all of these, you're allowed to write this. Um, okay, I mean, Kant doesn't think of a syllogism that way. Um, Kant thinks of a syllogism as you have a judgment. This is going to be the conclusion. And now the syllogism is, is going to connect these two things. Um, how is it going to connect them? Well, um, so in the simplest case, which is called a categorical syllogism, where the first premise, so in the syllogisms Kant thinks about, I think usually the conclusion is a categorical judgment. And the second or minor premise is also a categorical judgment. But so the type of syllogism has to do with the type of the first or major premise. So the categorical syllogism, the major premise, that is the first premise, also looks like this. And then there's another premise, the minor premise, that looks like this. Right? So, I mean, this is like, I don't know if anyone here has ever studied Aristotelian logic, but this is the typical, this is like the most typical form of a syllogism, which Aristotle discusses. Um, uh, there's many other weird ways of doing it. Kant says those, those are all uh, superfluous, really, but this is the one to think about. So you see the way S has been connected to P is by means of this third concept, F. So, so really, the syllogism, the syllogism is really uh, syllogism is really a judgment by means of something else. <laughs> and so sometimes Kant will call the conclusion of the syllogism just the judgment of the syllogism. And sometimes he'll call this concept here the subject of the syllogism. Um, now, like so far, so far, this is kind of the same thing that Locke says about inference, right? Locke says that the way inference works is I have two ideas and I can't see intuitively whether they agree with each other or not. And in order to see whether they agree with the other each other or not, I have to find at least one other idea to put in between. And Locke suggests that it would be better to just write it this way. <laughs> right? That all, all these repetition of symbols is superfluous. 
the main point is I'm saying S is P by way of N. Um, however, Kant, I think, sees, and, and so, by the way, Locke says, why do this? Well, again, only because it's not self-evident that S is P. I'm in doubt whether S is P. And to find out, I have to supply this medium, mediating judgment, mediating idea, Locke's terminology or concept that allows me to compare this. But I think Kant wants something more and different out of the syllogism. I think that Kant's idea is that the syllogism explains why the conclusion is true. So it's therefore it's important, first of all, not to just, you can't just grab any concept that will work. <laughs> um, you want to make sure you're actually explaining this. Um, we give examples of that, but I think I won't because I'm low on time. Um, so, uh, Right, and the general explanation for how that's possible, how the syllogism. So, so I mean, first of all, that's why also why we shouldn't just write it like this. Um, because each one of these judgments has its own role to play. And it's important that each one of them is a judgment. Let me, maybe it'll be clearer if I read what he says about it. So this is on bottom of B360. It's on page 304 in Kemp Smith. Uh, bottom of B360, top of B361. In every syllogism, I first think a rule, the major premise, through the understanding. So... I think I wrote this backwards from the late cover. I think it's important. Yes. The whole thing about this about whether it makes sense. See, if, if you think of inferences the first way I was talking about, it doesn't matter which order you write. Right? It's just that if you have these two premises, you can reach this conclusion. Even if you think about it Locke's way, it doesn't really matter which order you write it in, because this is symmetrical. But for Kant, it does make a difference which order you write it in, because he's going to explain how it works. In every syllogism, I first think of rule through the understanding. Secondly, I subsume something under the condition of the rule by means of judgments, the minor premise. So this is the major premise, and this is the minor premise, and this is the conclusion. And are these on the screen? Yeah. So the rule, I think, when he describes the major premise, he's being a little bit loose. He says, I, the under, I think it's a rule for the understanding. But of course, in the major premise, I think the rule on a condition. That is, I make a judgment. And then in the minor premise, I subsume something under the condition of the rule. Right? So this is the condition. Here it is again, and now I'm subsuming something. So these are not just two random uh, judgments here. These are right, this, the, the method for explaining why SSP is to first find out what is the condition of P, and then try to subsume S under it. Finally, what is thereby known, I determine through the predicate of the rule. 
right? So again, that's this. What is thereby known that is this? I determine through this, and that's the conclusion. Also, I guess I haven't been emphasizing, right? He said this is the understanding. The understanding is what allows me to make this kind of simple judgment. This is already the faculty of judgment, the power of judgment, which is um, that is applying this to a case. I guess he really is thinking of. Maybe this is something I don't understand. Maybe this is somehow a key to what I don't understand about why judgments come first. And here he's calling this whole judgment the rule. And yet it has a condition in it. I usually try to interpret the predicate of the rule and the subject of the condition. All right, don't worry about that because if I change my mind about that, you, you get confused and that's fine. <laughs> but so in any case, I mean, it's just a matter of terminology here, I guess. The main point is, um, here I'm using the faculty of judgment to say, what is the, in, to apply this to a case, namely the case of S. And then finally, I use the faculty of reason to conclude a priori. Now here we don't mean absolutely a priori, but before any further experience. Right? That is, I don't know either any further experience of S to learn that it's G. If I already know that it's M, and M was a known condition of this rule, then I can I can subsume S under it without experiencing that. Um, oh boy. Okay, I have one minute left. So, but this same thing happened last year, as I know from my notes. But I didn't get. I think I actually got farther this time. Um, <laughs> um, so that okay, I'll say a little bit more about the types of syllogism and whatever next time. But I just wanted to make the main point about how this is going to work and how it's going to go wrong. So like. Reason provides a new kind of unity here that the judgment SSP by itself didn't provide. And the unity is unity of explanation. Right? So, um, so the judgment SSP, SSP, like collected the manifold of experience of S and applied P to it. And now reason, so it's not, it's not a different manifold, right? It's, I mean, we're still talking about the same object we were with, but we're unifying them in a different way. We're unifying the explanation of why they're being. Right, and this is why he keeps saying reason doesn't apply directly to the object. The understanding applies directly to the object. Reason has to do with the understanding and its judgments. Right, reason is taking this judgment as a whole and supplying one reason to it. Now, like a judgment could be true even though it, it can't be unified that way. Right, there's it could be that all cinnabar is red, but some of it is red for one reason and others is red for other reasons. As far as the understanding is concerned, that doesn't matter. The reason wants to find that further form of unity. The illusion is going to be when reason thinks so. Something about the object must guarantee that I'm all, I will always be able to do that. And that's where it starts to treat its concepts as analogous to the category of demanding something from the object. Um, but it's going to turn out that no object of experience could ever contain that guarantee, and therefore it seeks it somewhere else. Okay, that's all I have time for. I will see you next time when I hope I have my power cord. <laughs>